Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. Unless you have been living under a rock the last, I don't know, 20 years or so, you've heard of Vladimir Putin and you've undoubtedly heard about his invasions of countries that are nearby. Recently, Tucker Carlson did an interview with Putin and Putin made a lot of claims about Russian history. So I decided to look into those and I decided to have somebody on that can talk intelligently about the subject because I certainly cannot. So we've got today uh, an historian and political scientist, and he is the William H. Sewell Jr. Distinguished Professor, Professor of History at the University of Michigan, Professor Ronald G. Suny. Welcome to the show. Happy to be here. So what is or why is Putin seemingly obsessed with this certain version of history that he puts out there? Let's start with who we think Putin is. And I will probably in this broadcast talk about many different Putins, right? There's okay. an evolution to this guy and history. And, you know, he's been in power now for decades. And so there are a lot of changes in the world and in Putin himself. Putin, of course, originally was a uh, agent of the Soviet government. He was worked for the uh, Secret Service uh, abroad in Germany. Uh, he was a loyal Soviet citizen. He was a member of the Communist Party. Uh, and his, his original uh, uh, upbringing was as someone who you might call a state preserver, or someone who supported the state, a loyal person in the Soviet Union. Uh, and later, uh, you know, uh, he was disillusioned by the collapse of the Soviet Union and by its frailty. He worries about that a lot. And over the years, coming to power around 2000, he began to educate himself in a kind of history of the Soviet Union and of Russia. And as you mentioned, Mike, it's, he's become almost fanatical in trying to work out an understanding of the Russian past uh, and what, what it means for Russia. In other words, he wants to understand Russia's identity, which then would be the ground on which he would understand Russia's interests and who is with Russia, who is against Russia. That's, that's where he's about. The way he came to that history, whoever is teaching him that history, some conservative historians, uh, uh, people who defend basically a statist point of view, uh, adopted a view, which is familiar to many of us Russian and Soviet historians, as 19th century imperial Russian understandings of history. So, Here's a history that has rejected the Soviet experience, the 20th century revolutionary experience, and gone back to a 19th century uh, view of Russia, first of all, as a great power, was also a great power in the 20th century uh, in the Soviet period, uh, but one that has kind of grand claims to areas outside of Russia proper, that is the imperial space that made up the Tsarist Empire and later the Soviet Union. And that's where he comes from. That's the nature of his historical thrust. One of the claims that he puts out there is that the Ukrainian people aren't actually a people at all, that they're essentially an invention. First of all, is he right about that? And secondly, what is the basis for his claim? He's obviously wrong about the, the Ukrainians not being a people or being a nation. And in a way, he sort of fudges that question. So here's how I think uh, he, I would understand it. First of all, Putin argues that there are three brotherly nations. There's the great Russians, that's what we call Russians. There were the little Russians, that is the Ukrainians. And there were the white Russians, that is the Belarusians, right? So there are three peoples who make up this, uh, this uh, Russian brotherly family. Now, within that family, there ought to be cooperation and love and fraternal connections and all the rest of it. That would be the natural way things should go. But something happened. Ukrainians began to define themselves in an anti-Russian way, in a pro-Russian way. And they gravitated toward the West, and they even threatened to join NATO an alliance which Putin sees as directed against Russia and Russian interests. So then he has to explain, how could this one 
part of this trilateral brotherly conglomerate of countries have defected to the West. Ah, and then he invents something. Nazis have taken over Kiev. That is, as Nazis, they have turned these Ukrainians away from us. Now, think about this. If the Belarusians are also part of this trilateral big Russian nation, why aren't they invading? Because they already are semi-vassals of Russia. They're no threat to Russia. And that's actually what Putin wants. He wants Ukraine to be a vassal state. And it might be useful here, Mike, to make a distinction between nation and state. Okay. So state is government, institutions, you know, the, whoever controls what, as Max Weber, the famous German sociologist said, the monopoly of legitimate violence in a territory, right? And so there is a Ukrainian state. We'll get to that in a moment. Within that state, there is a Ukrainian people, certainly, who Putin argues are related to the Russians. But in many of his statements, he also notes and recognizes that there is a Ukrainian nation, but it's a nation that is turned away from its real essence and become anti-Russian, which is unnatural to Ukrainians. So I wouldn't say that he wants to annihilate the Russia, the Ukrainian nation or the Ukrainian people, but he wants to bring them back into the fold, right? Which would mean kind of great Russian dominance, which was the old czarist way of looking at little Russians, namely Ukrainians. One more point, and then I'll get you, I'll let you say something. Note the state is a different thing. The state is that institution. It's the country itself and all of that stuff. And what does Putin say about the Ukrainian state? Ah, that is artificial. That is, there was no real Ukrainian state. There certainly wasn't under czarism. Oh, maybe back in the 17th century, there were Cossack uh, areas and semi-independence. But in the 17th century, and this is something Putin was telling Tucker Carlson, those Ukrainians said, we want to be part of Russia. And they literally in 1654 uh, joined Russia uh, and, and became part of Russia, at least much of Ukraine, the part that didn't become Poland. Uh, and eventually that was that union between Ukraine and Russia. And the, But the state uh, that was formed uh, under the Soviets, that's an artificial state. It was formed and given to Ukrainian people uh, by Lenin. And he condemns Lenin, Vladimir Lenin, founder of the Soviet Union, for that betrayal. Now, contrary to the idea that the Ukrainian people are a myth, it's actually a myth uh, that they're traditionally Russians. Now, I, I read about this monk... Uh, I'm going to butcher his name, Gizel or Gizel. Uh, what role did he have in this whole thing, in this idea? I think he was I'm a not, German monk. I'm not sure who you're talking about. In but, in a Kente, in, in a Kente or in a, you know, I don't know. Uh, but I, I read that this, that this guy basically came up, he was a German monk, I believe, and he came up with this idea that the Ukrainians were actually a part of the Russians. They're actually Russians. Well, I don't know about this in the Kenti. I should dig deeper into the <laughs> early history of Ukraine. But I would say here's here's something you can sort of bank on. Uh, there, if we go back to, say, the 9th, 10th century, et cetera, there are Slavs in this area. Uh, eventually, uh, a kind of conglomerate uh, would be formed, which we call Rus, right? So the original group of principalities and duchies, etc., was called uh, Rus or Kievan Rus. And it's out of that Rus, these Slavic peoples, that eventually Russians, Belarusians, and Ukrainians will develop over centuries. So people on the edge of Russia, Putin keeps making a big point about this, uh, Akraina, out of which the name Ukraine comes, means the edge or the frontier. Out of that area, those people became Ukrainians, eventually getting their own language, their own literature, their own poets, their own intelligentsia, and eventually ideas that they are a nation, just like any other nation, that develops through history. And meanwhile, on the other side, the Russians were developing their own identity through centuries, and they had a state eventually centered in Moscow. 
uh, which did in fact by the 17th century take over a large part of Ukraine. So there, there was national development in both, both of which is, are, are perfectly legitimate, natural, or let's say historically, culturally generated formations of nations. And you could argue that by the 19th century and certainly in the 20th century within the Soviet Union, Ukrainians became a full-fledged nation with their own culture, with their own institutions and everything, but not a sovereign state because they were, of course, part of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. So they were a state, not a sovereign state, within the Soviet Union with a national culture that was becoming more and more solidified under the Soviets. What about Putin's claim that the Crimea is actually part of Russia? This is the complicated thing. Uh, countries claim territories. That is, once you have a nation in modern times and that nation forms a state, that nation state, just like old empires, tries to form a takeover, a territory, which they then call their homeland, right? So Israel took over Palestine, drove out Palestinians, and formed a state, which they want to be a Jewish national state, and they're still expanding right up to the present time. And Russia, a great empire, also claimed a huge territory, which was its own territory, and Crimea, and what's now the Donbass, or what Putin calls New Russia, the area that uh, Putin and the Russians are controlling at the moment, that is, by international law, part of Ukraine, that area was, at a certain point, largely in the 18th century, taken over by Russians, by Catherine the Great, right? And he makes a big point of that. So by conquest, driving out the local Tatars and putting your power over the local Cossacks, that became Russian territory. Now, what's interesting is, here's Crimea. So Crimea was part of Russia, and not only part of Russia, but part of Russia even during the Soviet Union, a disconnected part. Crimea was part of the Russian Federated Soviet Republic. In, 19, in 1954, on the, on the uh, 300th anniversary of Ukraine joining Russia, the Soviet official Nikita Khrushchev gave Crimea as a gift to Ukraine. So it became part of Ukraine. Then when the Soviet Union collapsed and it was decided by the international community, by Russia, by Ukraine, that the boundaries of the Soviet republics would become the boundaries of these new independent states, Crimea, by international law, went to Ukraine. And Putin broke that international law, even broke treaties that Russia had, had signed in 2014 and seized through a kind of plebiscite in Crimea, Crimea, and took it away from Ukraine and claims it as part of Russian territory. I was, you mentioned Catherine the Great. I, I, in doing research for this interview, I, I read about the influence that uh, Voltaire had in this whole thing because of his influence over Catherine the Great and that he actually was trying to talk her into taking over the Crimea. Are you familiar with that at all? So Catherine the Great, uh, who ruled at the end of the 18th century, 1762 to 1796, Catherine the Great uh, was what we call an enlightened monarch. I'm not sure how enlightened she was. She turned lots of peasants into serfs and gave them free-handedly all over to her nobles, etc. But we'll say she was enlightened. In other words, she spoke French, she wrote plays, she wrote essays, she talked about reform, she didn't do much about it, but she was this kind of enlightened monarch. And the enlightened monarch like Catherine the Great or Frederick the Great or whatever at the same time were in touch with the people in France largely, who we call philosophes, the philosophers, that is the enlightenment intelligentsia. And among them, most importantly for Catherine, were Voltaire and the encyclopedist, the one who created the great encyclopedia, Diderot. 
Those were the two main ones. And she corresponded with them. And uh, Voltaire and so forth uh, wrote about the history of Russia. Diderot, actually, I, as if I remember correctly, went to Russia and got so excited talking to Catherine the Great that he actually banged her on her knee, which is not something you're supposed to do to an empress, but she at least tolerated it. Uh, so there was that association. So she was a very respected monarch. Uh, why was she great? She was great because she conquered neighbors. That's what makes you great, right? Mm -hmm. Peter the Great conquered the Baltic areas at, at the area where Petersburg is today or Leningrad in the Soviet times. And Catherine the Great took that new Russia, the crescent that Putin now has retaken, that links up with Crimea. And she took Crimea as well. You mentioned this uh, denazification uh, idea of Putin's. <laughs> he made the claim that traditionally uh, the Ukrainians have, there's been elements of Ukraine that have supported the Nazis. Um, and that's and now they're, they basically infiltrated the, the uh, upper echelons of power in Ukraine. And he has to go in there and get them out. What is the basis of this? Is there truth to it? Is it exaggerated? What's the story? I would say it's it's a fiction. It's uh, certainly an exaggeration. It's not that there aren't right wing nationalists or neo Nazis in in Ukraine. We happen to have a good chunk of neo Nazis <laughs> in America as well. Yes, we do. Know. So it's not a, it's not this is something that is a phenomenon all through Europe. And the irony is not only is the, the Ukrainian government a relatively democratic government, right? Uh, uh, and uh, with an elected president who happens to be of Jewish uh, uh, background. Uh, not only that, but Putin is the sponsor and the supporter of much of the right wing conservative and even neo-fascist elements in European society. People like Viktor Orban, or Meloni in, in, in Italy, uh, or the French right wing, et cetera. He, he has been very much a supporter, even to the point of giving uh, funds to those peoples. So it's a kind of ironic thing that he's against this Nazi Nazis that he imagines are in Kiev. He knows better. He made this all up. It's part of the syllogism that he needs. Why has Ukraine gone away from us? because they're Nazis there and they hate Russia and they they fought in the Second World War against Russia, et cetera. So it, it's, it's, I would say, a largely a creation for the domestic audience to convince people. I know from talking to my Russian friends that few are convinced, but maybe an older generation with memories of World War II is more likely to be convinced. So what about the, this Stepan Ban, Bandera or Bandera and the, the, the Banderites? What, what's that all about? There, during World War I and during World War II uh, as well, uh, you'd have to say there were many elements of Ukraine that were not, I would say, very palatable and very progressive figures. That is, Ukraine had a long history of anti-Semitism as did Poland, as a matter of fact. And after World War I, there was a lot of fighting between Ukrainians, Poles, Jews, etc. There were pogroms. There was kind of a little Holocaust, even at the time, that would presage, which would pretell what was likely to happen later. And anti-Semitism was very, very widespread in that area. After World War II, this repeated itself again. Uh, and uh, there was there were Ukrainians, and Stepan Bandera was one of these people who led groups at the time, uh, at the end of the war, uh, that were that were uh, you could say neo-fascist groups that carried out these pogroms. Poles were fighting Ukrainians. Ukrainians were killing Poles. Everybody was killing Jews, uh, and so you had this fierce thing, until eventually, by the early fifties, the Soviets, the Red Army, etc. Uh, got rid of those people, put them down, and drove many of them into exile into Europe. And Bandera eventually uh, would be killed uh, uh, by agents from the Soviets. Two two claims that Putin made, I'm, I'm going to ask you about them in turn. The, the first one is, and I don't know why he thought this was relevant, and that's what I'm hoping you can tell me, is he made this claim that 
Poland collaborated with Hitler. Now, all the history that I've read is that the Soviet Union and Hitler basically agreed to divvy up Poland. And Hitler, you know, violated his agreement with Neville Chamberlain when he invaded Poland on September 1st, 1939. But now Putin comes along and says that there is a collaboration between Poles and Hitler. Again, is there any truth to that? And why did Putin bring that up? This is one of the most bizarre uh, sort of fabrications that Putin made. So Poland was a state uh, that had found, you know, become again independent after uh, more than a century uh, by 1918. And eventually it became a kind of uh, anti-Soviet quite right wing state. And there was at one point a kind of, uh, uh, let's say, non-aggression pact between Poland and, and uh, uh, the Germans. But the, as you, your, your history is actually correct. It was Poland that Hitler first attacked, September 1st, 1939. They had a kind of false flag event around the German city of Danzig, and they invaded, and they ruthlessly uh, destroyed Polish resistance and took over the country in collaboration with the Soviets. Because Stalin had signed at the end of August 1939 a non-aggression pact, a collaborative pact, and was de facto an ally of Hitler's uh, from late August 1939 until the, Ner the Germans, the Nazis, invaded Hitler in June yeah. of 1941. Yeah, if Hitler doesn't double-cross Stalin, then the Russians <laughs> stay allies with the Germans. The, 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 the Hitler and Stalin divided Poland and eliminated it. Um, uh, you know, Stalin was pushing westward uh, because there was this obvious threat from, from the Nazis, and it took territory that was, by the way, largely populated by Ukrainians and by Belarusians and Jews as well. Uh, and that area after World War II would become part of Ukraine and uh, Belarus. That is, it's Stalin who actually expanded Ukraine and gave it ultimately its current boundaries. So this is what Putin would say is the artificial creation of the Ukrainian state. Lenin gave them parts of Eastern Ukraine and often areas which were Russian speaking like Kharkiv and so forth. And Stalin filled out that Ukraine and made it a very large state by taking parts of what had been Poland and Belarus between the wars as well as a ch little chunk of Czechoslovakia uh, and uh, Hungary as well. So by Putin's line of reasoning, Neville Chamberlain would have been collaborating with, with Hitler as well, right? Because he made an agreement with him, a, a non-aggression pact. That's right. And uh, so you're, you're talking about Munich. We're talking about 1938 now and Munich, the Mun Munich agreement and uh, the appeasement by France and and Britain that allowed Poland, excuse me, allowed Nazi Germany ultimately to take over Czechoslovakia, which was one more stepping stone toward the outbreak of World War II. This is not a period in which any country looks very good. Uh, the Soviet Union was dealing with Hitler when it came, push came to shove, and uh, the West had sort of given up on the Soviet Union. Uh, the the West had appeased. Hitler and allowed it to take Czechoslovakia. And only finally, when Hitler invaded Poland, did they go to war with Nazi Germany. The other question I had for you that, that uh, Putin made the claim is that the CIA was, or the United States government was funding separatists or terrorists. I assume he's talking about the Chechens, but he didn't say that. Is there evidence that backs that up? This was something that was quite amazing to me. My own research has been about uh, the Caucasus, largely the South Caucasus, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and Georgia. But he made this claim several times, and he insisted on it, that indeed the West was funding terrorists and funding separatists in the North Caucasus. And I mean to, at some point, try to investigate this. It's, it would take some digging, I imagine, and I don't know. I have never heard of it. 
I'm doubtful about it. But, you know, this is the kind of thing that uh, intelligence organizations, perhaps the CIA or whatever, do engage themselves in. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but no, there do, are a lot yeah. of secret things that go on that we, we don't know about. But I have not read about any serious discussion uh, about this kind of infiltration. It's possible, but I really would have to look deeper into it uh, than I have in, so far. Fair enough. What, in, in your opinion, is Putin's endgame? I mean, because this thing in Ukraine isn't exactly going how he thought it would go. Well, well, that's another question I have. How did, I mean, two questions for you. One is, how did this thing, how was he so wrong about how this invasion would go? And what is his endgame? How does he get out of this? And, you know, what are the effects for the rest of us? So let's start with the initial plan. Uh, there was a long hesitation of Putin to actually invade Ukraine. Uh, and I would say, you know, if you read and listen to what he was telling Tucker Carlson, he was he had over the years become more and more upset, more and more worried, may perhaps even paranoid about the expansion of NATO, about the threat that Ukraine would become part of NATO, that Ukraine uh, was already being armed by NATO. You could say that on the eve of the invasion, uh, Ukraine was not in NATO, but NATO was already in Ukraine. And only with the invasion by the Russians did the Americans pull their trainers out of Ukraine. The initial thrust then was that Putin, who was ill-informed by his advisors, who wasn't paying attention to the Russian experts on Ukraine, thought he could very quickly rush into Ukraine and with paratroopers decapitate the Ukrainian state, either kill or drive Zelensky to the West. And indeed, the Americans were already planning for Zelensky to set up a exile government in exile. Uh, and that failed. And the Ukrainians incredibly heroically and bravely stopped that initial thrust. And so the Russians, and you probably watched this on your TV, were bogged down in the mud of Ukraine. They had waited too long for the invasion because Putin was busy in Beijing looking at the Olympics once again. Uh, and he waited long so that the Chinese wouldn't be embarrassed. Uh, and they had to give up that initial uh, interest in taking all of Ukraine. So I think what they did, and this is another Putin, I think what he then decided to do was, okay, I'm going to seize the uh, area I call New Russia, Novorossiya, and that crescent in the eastern part of Ukraine, the Donbass. I'm going to annex them and link up with Crimea, and that will be what I want. So he's reduced his goals. He's taken over that area, and they're doing rather well right now. They're outnumbering the Ukrainians both in manpower and in weaponry. And they and if if what he said is true, there were two points he made. One, let's negotiate. He kept saying he wants to negotiate. Ukraine won't negotiate. The Americans won't let the Ukrainians negotiate. But let's negotiate. And we basically will keep what we have. That's one thing. And the second thing he said, which, of course, people in the West, many of them don't believe, is we're not interested in going any further. We're not going to go into NATO countries. That would be absurd. And that sounds reasonable to me because look how badly they did uh, in Ukraine and how costly it's been. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people dead. And Russians themselves are either indifferent to this war or discontented with the war, disillusioned by the war, and they, they want to get on with their own lives, which we're not doing badly before Putin made this colossal error of invading Ukraine. One last question, and it's kind of anachronistic to the, well, no, it's not anachronistic. That's the wrong word, it, but it is a little bit out of the way here. He said that the idea that Boris Yeltsin was fond of booze was a Western creation. Is that true? Because I've always, like, I used to watch Boris Yeltsin on TV and he seemed drunk to me, <laughs> but, uh, you know what I mean? But, but Putin says that that was just a lie created by the West. Boris Yeltsin was a serious alcoholic. <laughs> he, uh, we have too many films and so forth. You can read Bill, Bill Clinton's memoirs or Strobe Talbot's memoirs and you'll see what was really going on. 
And it was Boris Yeltsin, of course, not only who helped bring down the Soviet Union, which the Americans thought, uh, you know, at the time they didn't think it was such a good idea, but later they got used to the idea. They got rid of their major enemy in the world, uh, only to find China later on. Uh, but, but he, of course, was also someone who was realistic enough about Russia's interests that he opposed NATO expansion. But unfortunately, he kept giving into it as Putin, uh, excuse me, as, as Clinton and then the Bushes uh, moved, moved um, the NATO alliance further and further toward Russia. No, he was seriously alcoholic. And Putin, who was, of course, the benef beneficiary of Yeltsin's largesse, it was Yeltsin who gave us Putin. It was Yeltsin who appointed Putin and pushed him to become president. Uh, it was a kind of legal coup d'etat around the year 2000. Uh, we can thank Yeltsin and many of those who supported the so-called Democrat Yeltsin for Putin and what has followed from the collapse of the Soviet Union. Lest I be seen as somebody just besmirching the character of Boris Yeltsin, I will say that from what I understand, he's a guy that had tremendous courage. Uh, I believe he rode on the hood of a tank or, or some such thing it, during the uh, uprising in, in Russia, during, you know, at the fall of the Soviet Union. So he he wasn't just some silly drunk, but he, he was an alcoholic. It, would, that, would that be fair? That's right. Putin, I'm sorry, Yeltsin did very well on top of tanks. Uh, he he defended uh, uh, the the White House, as it was called, his, his uh, headquarters against the coup, coup d'etat uh, that was sought to overthrow Gorbachev. Uh, and when that coup d'etat failed, then Yeltsin very slickly, uh, he weakened Gorbachev and ultimately brought the Soviet Union down. Okay, Professor, it, before I let you go, is there anything that of vital importance that I neglected to ask that you think people should know about in relation to this topic? I think the one thing I didn't answer was where would we go from here? What's likely to happen? Nothing is going to really happen until the election of re-election of Biden or the election of Trump. Putin has time on his hands. He's doing well. And he'll wait for that event. If Trump does in fact win the election, then all bets are off. And you can, you know what he said this weekend about NATO and inviting Russia to squeeze NATO countries or take them over or whatever. It's complete absurdity, of course, uh, if in fact they don't pay their bills, because I guess joining NATO is like, you know, uh, I don't know. A country club? <laughs> a country club or a mafia that you have to pay your dues. <laughs> your tri to tribute money. money. <laughs> yes. Anyway, we have to wait and see in this in what's going to happen later in this year. Okay, Professor, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. Do you have a, a, a website or a blog or anything where people can find you? Oh, I'm all over the internet. I don't have a website. I'm not that organized, but there's so many. I don't either. This is lectures and so forth. And you'll send me a link to this one. I will definitely send you a link to this one. Thank you so much. My pleasure. For now, this is The Rational Egoist signing out. Remember, I want to know your likes, your dislikes, and I wouldn't even mind if you shared the episode. Till next time.